So our first presentation today is with Professor Sir Harry Burns. He, as most of you will know and remember, has been the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland for many, many, many years. And his most current role is the Professor for Global Health for Strathclyde University. But to us, he is the Scottish Manchester Association's patron. And we are very pleased for the first time to have him speaking and uh, at, at the AGM. And what he's going to speak about is a bit of myth busting about Scotland's health and maybe some of the ideas that we believe. So I was um, fascinated by what he shared, and I'm sure you will be as well. So without further ado, let's have a look at that uh, information that Harry's going to share, and we shall speak to him soon afterwards. Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Harry Burns. Uh, I am the patron of the Scottish Men's Sheds Association, and I should explain to you why I became uh, interested in the Men's Sheds uh, movement. I started off life as a surgeon. I worked for several years in uh, surgery at Glasgow Royal Infirmary, and that experience led me to a different view of health. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a few slides up to show you the way in which my view of health and well-being developed as a result of my experience at the Royal Infirmary. What I realized was that there were significant inequalities in health across the social spectrum. People at the lower end of the social spectrum tended to be much less healthy than more affluent people. And what I realized was, as doctors were told that poor health is caused by too much illness, what I realized as a surgeon at the Royal Infirmary was, it's actually a problem of not enough wellness. I remember well inviting a patient, uh, having a patient come in, it was about the third time he'd come in with a particular problem that was caused by alcohol. And I remember saying to him, listen, John, if you keep on drinking, you're going to die. And the response was, I know, I'm not stupid, but I don't care because life is really crap and the booze is the only pleasure I've got in life. And I realized that we as doctors go on and on and on and tell people that they're doing bad things. And in fact, Quite often, you don't care. So I then gave up surgery and went off and did public health. And I am going to talk to, you, talk to you a bit about what I learned doing public health. So the first thing was I began to question what we believe about Scotland's health. I mean, we are told persistently that we're very unhealthy because we smoke too much, eat the wrong kind of food, drink too much. And if only we would get a grip and do healthy things, we wouldn't have all this big load of ill health. Well, what I realized in looking at the data was only one of those statements is true. And regrettably, it's the one about the booze. Scotland's not an unhealthy place. This slide shows life expectancy trends in 16 Western European countries going back to 1851, 170 years worth of life expectancy data. And you can see for most of that time, Scotland is right bang in the middle of Western European life expectancy. It's only up here around about the 1950s that we began to slip towards the back of the pack. If you look at the rate of growth since the 1950s in the richest 20% of the population, they've outperformed their European colleagues. They have improved their life expectancy faster than average, whereas the poorest 20% of the population has slowed down its rate of growth in life expectancy so that the average growth in life expectancy in Scotland has fallen because of this widening inequality. And I won't go into the detail because we don't have a lot of time, but it's not because we smoke too much. Smoking, men, men, male smoking in Scotland now is less than many European countries. Uh, the diet and so on isn't great, but it's not 
the cause of the problem. I'll just show you the data on alcoholic liver disease. This slide shows of our 16 Western European countries, this was the highest level any of our 16 Western European countries reached. This was the lowest level. And this since the 1950s is the average death rate from alcoholic liver disease. And where would you think Scotland would be in this graph? Would it be up here or down here? Well, the fact is, From 1950 to 1970, Scotland had one of the lowest alcoholic liver disease death rates of any European country. It went up a bit till the mid 1990s, and then, of course, our, you know, licensing laws changed and so on, and that's what happened. It's come down a bit since then, but we're not where we are from the 1950s onwards because we were drinking too much. We're it's an issue for us now, but it hasn't been the basic cause of our problems. Let me explain to you what the cause of our inequalities are. And this is, in, is, is a study done by a colleague of mine at Glasgow University, in which he took five-year age groups and he split them into five different quintiles, 20% of the population in each of these groups. And this is based on where they lived, how affluent the area is. So the people living in the smart bits in the West End of Glasgow and the new town in Edinburgh and so on, up here, 1,600 deaths per 100,000 people living in that group, down here to about 4,000 deaths in the most deprived areas, 4,000 deaths per 100,000 population per annum. And you can see there's a steady downward step. What he then did was he did that for five-year age groups, and then he plotted those in a graph. And it was a graph that used a thing called the slope index of inequality. You can reflect the steepness of that inequalities graph by subtracting the best from the worst and dividing by the average. And you come up with a number here. And one is roughly about a 45 degree inequality slope. When you plot that, you see an interesting thing that surprised us. We always think that inequalities in deaths are caused by too many cancer deaths and too many heart disease deaths. And these, these deaths occur in older people. But you see here, the inequality slope shoots up in teenage years. It's its highest in young working age people, and it's actually coming down in the 50s and 60s. So he then went a step further, and he looked at individual causes of death. This is ischemic heart disease, heart attacks and heart failure and so on. And he took deaths from all the different causes you could think of, created the slope index of inequality. And here's the pattern of inequality and in death rates for heart disease. You can see it's relatively, it's a relatively minor contributor to inequalities in death rates, and it occurs far later than where the big drivers are. So what is causing all this inequality at that stage in life? Well, it's disorders due to the use of drugs, suicide, alcohol, violence, and accidents. That's what's causing inequalities in young working age people. Drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence. These are social causes of death. They represent a lack of wellness, a lack of well-being, rather than eating too much fatty food. And, you know, I, you know, I get frustrated with politicians when they stand up and say, we're going, to, we're going to narrow inequalities. We're going to ban advertising of fatty foods on televisions late at night. Drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence is about the social circumstances in which we live. And it's not just in Scotland that we've seen this. This is a study on deaths from drugs, alcohol, and suicide in men and women in their early 50s white non-Hispanic residents of the United States. You can see that from about the year 2000, there's been a huge increase in deaths from these deaths of despair. And when you look at where these deaths of despair have occurred, it tends to be 
in areas that have lost traditional industries, areas you know that had coal mining, that had um, that had uh, steelworks and so on. Very similar to places like Glasgow, where shipyards closed, Lanarkshire, where steelworks have closed, mining areas, and Fife and so on. Deaths of despair. When people lose their jobs, they turn to the booze and, you know, and these drugs, alcohol and suicide and violence and accidents and so on are the basic drivers of inequality. So what can we do about it? What causes wellness? Now, as doctors, we learn about pathology the causes of disease, pathogenesis is the term given to causes of disease. I came across this slide, which came from uh, Sweden, salutogenesis, Salus was the Roman goddess of well-being and safety. And the Scandinavians, instead of talking about pathogenesis, they teach their doctors about salutogenesis, the various things that create well-being in people. And I'm, I know you'll be really sad to hear this, but I'm not going to describe to you all 25 of these different theories. But they are all broadly similar in what they are saying about things. And you see words here like optimism, hopefulness, resourcefulness, emotional intelligence, being connected, feeling as if you're flourishing and resilient, having gratitude and humor and empathy. These are the things that underlie this sense of well-being. And I'll give you some examples of how you can actually create that sense of well-being amongst people who have grown up to like it. I remember talking, I used to go to prisons a lot, and most of the time they let me out okay. But I remember once talking to a guy who had been in Berlini, and what he told me was, as a young child, he, his parents fought like cat and dog, and he always got the blame for it. It was always his fault. And then when he went to school, if there was any trouble in the class, he would get the blame for it. And then when he left school, he would go out with his mates and there'd be a fight and he'd get the blame for it. And eventually he ended up having assaulted someone quite badly. And when I met him, he had a job. He was helping other people and was a charming, wonderful guy. And what he told me was that he transformed his life. What transformed his life was a prison officer coming in to his cell every day and sitting down and talking to him and treating him like a human being and telling him, you're clever. You don't need to be in here. You could do something with your life. And gradually, Building trust in that individual built a sense of control that this guy had and a sense of his ability to be in control and make positive choices for his life. The Broadway experiment was the City of London Council decided they had these 13 rough sleepers who between them had been sleeping rough for four and 45 years. And they decided that this usual way of fixing them was, you know, just to give them a voucher for a bed in a hostel or whatever, they decided they were going to try and build that trust and sense of control. So they set up 13 bank accounts, £3,000 in each of them, and they gave these 13 rough sleepers a mentor, someone who didn't come to them and tell them what to do, but went and asked them, what matters to you? What do you need? How can I help you? The first thing anyone asked for was this new pair of spectacles. This guy said, well, I like to read the papers that people throw away, but I've lost my specs and I can't read anymore. The most expensive thing anyone asked for was this guy who said, well, the only time in my life I've ever been happy was as a boy when my parents would take me down to Kent to a caravan park on holiday. Can you see if there's a, an old caravan there that I could buy and I'll go and live there? A year later, these hardcore rough sleepers, 11 of the 13 were in permanent accommodation, and a couple of them had got jobs. Hardcore rough sleepers. The average spend out of the £3,000 bank accounts was £800. 
The Economist magazine reviewing this concluded that the most efficient way to spend money in the homeless might just be to give it to them. The way in which we try to help people in difficulty by doing things to them is wrong. We help them learn that they can do things themselves and they take that sense of control. Another example of this was the Beacon and Old Hill Estate in Falmouth and uh, Cornwall when the, the naval dockyard closed. The place just went to hell. It was known locally in the area as Beirut. It had about 3,000 people living in it and so on. And I met once a health visitor, two health visitors between them produced these results. And they did it by basically saying enough is enough. There's too much violence. There's too much horrible things happening here. They wrote 50 letters to people living in the area that they thought might help them make a difference. Five people turned up to the meeting. And between those five people and those two health visitors, they went round and asked people what mattered to them. And by helping them achieve the things they wanted, like getting their gardens started up, getting their houses painted and so on. They went out and they got some money and they bought tools. And one of the health visitors told me that one of the first gardens they went to to tackle, the front garden was so overgrown with trees and bushes and so on that as they started to hack these things down, they discovered that parked in this front garden was a Ford Transit van that everyone had just forgotten about. You can see the improvement in well-being, crime down, postnatal depression down, unemployment down, child protection registrations down, teenage pregnancies almost disappeared. The, the chief constable of the area made a formal apology to the area. They said, we just turned our backs on you. The people did it for themselves. We still come up against the kind of attitude that this guy showed. Joseph Townsend was a Church of England cleric. He was also a medical doctor. And he wrote a book on the history of the, the poor law. And in it, he said, hunger will tame the fiercest animals. It will teach decency and civility, obedience and subjection. It is only hunger which car can spark and goad the poor onto labor. You punish poor people, was his attitude. I once asked a group of folk, um, we would never have, no one has that attitude anymore. And this guy put his hand up and he said, how about the Department of Work and Pensions? <laughs> um, but, oh, and the other thing I like to say is that I'm a medical graduate of Glasgow University. Joseph Townsend was a medical graduate of Edinburgh University. Just making that point. We've moved on from that. We've moved on to think not about punishing poor people, but about supporting them to take control of their lives. And one of the first guys that ever inspired me was Jimmy Reed, leader of Upper, Upper Clyde Ship, yeah, Shipbuilders. Many of you will remember Jimmy. In 1971, as a medical student at Glasgow University, we elected him in as Lord Rector of Glasgow University in his rectorial address, reprinted in full in the New York Times, which described it as the most important public speech since the Gettysburg Address. And that was absolutely right. It was about alienation, which he defined as the cry of men who feel themselves the victims of blind economic forces beyond their control the frustration of ordinary people excluded from the processes of decision-making, the feeling of despair and hopelessness that pervades people who feel with justification they have no say in shaping or determining their own destinies. He nailed it. That's what the science, the public health science tells us. Despair, not feeling able to be in control of your life, feeling hopeless and helpless until someone comes along and helps you take control you are lacking well-being. Another guy who inspired me is this guy, this clerical guy, Catholic priest who in 30 years ago was sent to the most violent parish in Los Angeles. LAPD stopped him walking down the street the day he arrived and told him, if you carry on walking down the street, Father, you'll be dead in half an hour. These Latino gangs are vicious. He carried on walking down the street and 30 years later, He's helped 4,000 families take control of their lives. You can see here. And the way he did it was he asked them, 
what matters to them. And what he said was, well, we don't have jobs. We don't have things to do. The drugs and the fighting are the only things we do. So he went to friends like this guy in the suit um, and got some money and he bought a disused bakery and he started a company called Homeboy Bakeries. And the Violence Reduction Unit in Glasgow invites Greg Boyle over periodically and I take him around schools and to talk to the kids and so on about that sense of control and comradeship and looking after each other and so on. And this is what he tells the kids. What we need is a compassion that stands in awe at the burdens the poor have to carry rather than one that stands in judgment at how they carry them. Looking after each other, supporting each other, helping each other is what helps people get out of these difficulties with the drugs and the alcohol and, and the negative mental health issues and so on. And my final slide, this other guy that I'm telling you about my heroes, Terry Waite. Uh, was sent by the Archbishop of Canterbury as an envoy to Beirut when there was a civil war there. And he was there to negotiate for the release of hostages. Instead of getting hostages released, he was captured and held prison and prisoner for about five years. And I once sat next to him at a dinner and he laughed the whole time. He told me joke after joke about this terrible experience he had where he just didn't know from one day to the next if they were going to kill him or not. And at the end of it, I asked him, OK, Terry, what's the answer to the problems of the world? What's the answer to the Middle East? What's the answer to, to poverty and so on? And that's what he said to me. Love and compassion, caring for each other, looking after each other. So I'll just finish by saying that, to my mind, the men's shed movement brings people together. It's clear to me, looking at the videos and so on, that you support each other, that you're there for each other, you help each other take control of their lives. And this is absolutely central to this notion of creation of well-being, and long may it continue. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Well, um, in the console, it's all looking good. <laughs> We're scattered about the country uh, with um, everybody in different houses doing the technology, but it's all working. So we're all singing and dancing. So that's fantastic. Um, thanks for managing to come on today, Harry, and for that great presentation. Um, we're getting some really good um, replies, et cetera, in the chat that people have found it really, really interesting. I've got a question coming in from Shona Fowler, who works for the NHS, and she uh, works in with the Kinross and Perth area and, her, and works with the men's shed there, particularly at Kinross men's shed. So if you could uh, put your video and unmute yourself, that would be good. And you can ask your question, Shona. Sure. Hi. Morning, Jason. Morning, Harry. Um, I've typed a question in there as well to Jason, just to, just to highlight it. Um, in our role, we work for the NHS, Harry. There's, I think, Audra's here as well, my equivalent in the, the north of Persia. Um, and we help start up the men's sheds, uh, keep them going, uh, help them access funding and ensure that well-being's to the fore of everything that they do um, and staying connected. Now, we try to connect our very marginalised groups um, in our areas as well, our uh, groups such as newly released prisoners, um, people with drug addictions, uh, people who from different communities who are perhaps not uh, as embraced so well uh, uh, as their, their neighbours are. Um, in smaller rural towns, there's preconceptions often borne out from bad experience they've had themselves. Any advice on how, how we go over this uh, and how we, we, we tie these people together uh, and reach our most marginalised to make everywhere inclusive? Well, my, my experience is that stories are important. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. People make judgments. You know, this guy's been in prison, therefore he is a bad guy. Well, no, he's probably been in prison because he's experienced all sorts of problems in childhood. He hasn't learned how to engage properly. He hasn't 
learned any sense that um, he could make a difference in his life. Hopelessness and helplessness. I've got a PhD student just now who's been looking at um, exactly that, and it's very plain to see that that sense of hopelessness is associated with all the problems that you're talking about. But the stories that you can tell are the things that will make a big difference. I mean, that story I told about the guy with the prison officer coming in and talking to him, it's a real life story. That guy is now one of my best friends. He is a lovely guy who looks after young people when he takes them out and he tells them the same thing. He has made a difference. I'll tell you another story, <laughs> which uh, I love. Um, in the east end of Glasgow, just before the, the Commonwealth Games development started, two planning officers were sent out to talk to the people in the east end of Glasgow about what changes they were wanting to see in the area. And one day they, they, they just went and knocked on doors. What is it you'd like to see? What do you want? You know, not they didn't come to tell them what the council were going to do. They came to ask them what the council should do. They came across this woman who was age 70. And this woman told them that she had not left her house for about eight years. Her husband had died. She couldn't read or write. She had such a low sense of self-esteem that she just sat in her house all the time and her neighbors did all the shopping for her. And she had not crossed the door for all that time. So they went, they said, that's terrible. We'll go back and we'll talk to her. We'll take her in cakes and biscuits. We'll sit and have a cup of tea with her. They befriended her. They asked me along to the community centre, the two planning officers asked me to this community centre to talk to some people. And there was this wee lady sitting around the table with the others. And halfway through the meeting, she looked at what she got up and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave. And they went out and I noticed everyone else was smiling. Do you know what Jeannie's a way to do? No, she's a way to lead the belly dancing class. <laughs> <laughs> But here's a wee woman who has been completely shut down and now she's putting herself at the service of the community. So these stories are powerful and they begin to convince people that, well, we can make a difference here. And, you know, storytelling is not scientific, so my colleagues tell me, but it makes a difference. Brilliant. Thank you, Harry. That's good advice and I'll take it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Great question. And now we go to uh, Dr. Danny Hutchinson, me, Kelly. And Danny, um, just saying, Harry, is from Glasgow, Kelly University. <laughs> She's <laughs> been, just saying, just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Glasgow University too. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> She is the one who has been working with the Sheds over the last four years and doing all the research, et cetera. So good to see you, Danny. Um, fire away with your question. Um, hi, Jason. Hi, Harry. Harry, that was um, a brilliant presentation. Um, just to say, I really read it, just totally resonated with the research that we did around that idea of, you know, giving people a sense of value, a sense of purpose. Um, that support, empowering people. Um, I'm just, um, uh, our research kind of, um, the current project we're working with is just coming to an end at the moment, but we'd love to kind of continue working with Men's Sheds and doing some research around that. Um, I was just wondering if you have any insights on, uh, or thoughts on any type of research that might be needed in the future. Um, well, it all depends on what kind of research you're comfortable with. I mean, one of the interesting things is I have spoken to lots of researchers on inequalities and so on over the years, and some of the most powerful stuff comes from um, neuroscientists. You know, what they have shown is that if as children we experience de deprivation and, and violence and so on, brain development goes off in a certain direction. You become more anxious, aggressive, fearful, and the centers of the brain that are associated with that become more active. You become less well able to make decisions and the prefrontal cortex of the brain becomes less 
you know. So there are certain brain changes. And then a few years ago, um, a colleague of mine working in New York, who has since unfortunately died, showed that mentoring and things like physical activity and so on, he followed a group of men through this and showed that their brains developed the way they should have done. The brains react to the circumstances in which you live and develop a different pattern depending on your experience. So I would love to be doing some research and I don't know if you're still involved with Glasgow University, but there is a neuroscientist at Glasgow University uh, who did a lot of studies for us and showed us that this thing that was being observed in New York was actually what was happening in Glasgow. So if you want to email me, I can put you in touch with, with uh, these guys. And to be able to show that, I mean, I, I, we all know intuitively that it's that connection that makes the difference. But to be able to show a biological pattern, that's really convincing to the doubters. Stephanie, thank you so much for that, Harry. Um, just to say another thing that we're interested in looking at is the role of men's sheds in um, kind of addressing... Uh, issues with around drug and alcohol use yeah. in, in, in men as well that's something I'd love to do some work yeah. on as well well yeah. I'll tell you one one seminal moment in my journey and understanding all of this I was giving a talk and at the end of it this guy came up to me and he said I've heard you speak before I think you'd be interested in this and he gave me a brown paper package <laughs> when I opened it it was the book of Alcoholics Anonymous he said exactly what you describe is what got me moving into a better place. And Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, befriending people, trusting relationships with your sponsor and all that kind of thing. They, they sussed this out many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it is, and I think it's mentioned, they really give that sense of value to people and that sense yes. of, you know, responsibility, having a routine and that they've maybe lost as well, especially in terms of, um, you know, alcohol use and addiction, yeah. Um, no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, the, the research so important and, uh, you know, it's been four years in the waiting in the wings, so to speak, for me. And I'm generally quite an impatient guy, but it has taught me patience that we've had to wait for four years for this research to be concluded, which ended with the um, how to start a main shed uh, toolkit, which was fantastic and has been really well received across the country. Um, we have a question here uh, from Brian Kerr, I think from Dumfries yeah. Men's Shed, Harry. Um, he's saying, can we get the politicians in the Scottish Parliament and DEEDS and UK to see the presentation? And obviously he's impressed and see you know, and help for the homeless, for instance. Well, what I can say um, to you on that, uh, Brian, is we had a meeting with one of the cabinet secretaries um, a few weeks ago, there he is. And thankfully, Harry was on that call as well. And I don't know if you want to speak on that, into that at all, Harry. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to talk specifically about that call. But I mean, I, I have worked with politicians on this all the time. And what I say to them is the basic thinking is there. It's how you apply it. And you don't apply it by a politician standing up and saying, we're going to do X, we're going to do Y, we're going to do the next thing, because that's doing things to people. What I say to them is create a network where you go out and ask people what they think they need and then collect the data and show that that process is effective. And I'm still, you know, I'm, I feel at times as if I'm banging my head against a brick wall, but um I think slowly, if we keep on saying it, frontline staff, frontline people are the people who will make the difference, not a politician pontificating. So that's the, that's the line I'm taking uh, just now. And I've got two or three of the senior civil servants interested, and they're trying to work out, well, how can we get political support for this? So keep at it. Keep talking to your politicians about that. That's great. 
Yeah, we certainly will keep on banging in away at those politicians. And more than ever, um, if you can, in your local areas, speak to your councillors, that has proved absolutely invaluable to keep your local councillors up to speed with what's going on, particularly when the shed needs to move or get new premises, et cetera, to put and lean, put pressure on the councils, et cetera, in that respect. So it, it is coming in from the top. Um, if there is a top in this in this circle, let's say, of, of the men's shed movement, Harry and myself and others um, are definitely speaking to the politicians on your behalf, our members, but it also definitely needs to come from a local level because they then take that to the uh, higher up councillors and politicians, et cetera. So it is a group effort. So thanks for that. Uh, good question, Brian. Right, next we move on to Archie Peebles. I see his hand is up. Archie, if you can put your camera on and you'll be spotlighted and on you go. I'll try this button as well. Right. Uh, on behalf of the rank and file, uh, if you, uh, members of the Scottish Merchant, I'd like to say to Sir Harry Burns, uh, welcome to our movement, and also a great thanks to you for deciding to actually come and be our patrons. I think it has given us great faith that uh, the health services will uh, acknowledge the need uh, to provide us with uh, help, and it's good that you're able to do that. And uh, I just wondered, uh, another great Scott that, you, you, that you, you, you may not have mentioned, but has spoken on the Manchester movement, and that's uh, Billy Conley. And his latest book, he was talking about, and I think you referred to uh, Clyde Side and the, the shipyards there. He, of course, was started off as working life there. And he mentioned that often when he uh, would see some of his old colleagues uh, on their, uh, their, their, their retirement day. Often he would see them 18 months later, but unfortunately they would have passed on by then. I just wonder if you have any comments on the, how the men shared movement has improved the, uh, the retirement life of uh, men uh, around Scotland. Well, in order to demonstrate that, you need to collect quite a lot of data from a lot of different people. You know, if you've got small numbers, it's difficult to show statistical significance in terms of, um, you know, do people who go to men's sheds live longer? Uh, how long do they live? You know, that kind of thing. You need to be collecting a lot of data and you need to know have they just gone once or twice to the men's sheds or are, are they, you know, are they really engaged with it? Because I would guess if they come along once or twice and think, no, this isn't for me, then they, they are in some difficulty in their, in where, they're, where they're at um, psychologically. Um, so it's quite, it would be quite a hard study to do, but if we got sufficient numbers, it might well be possible. Um, the other thing that you wouldn't be able to say is that it's the men's sheds that's made a difference. It might be that men that go to men's sheds self-select, you know, they are actually more engaged and they're more uh, interested. So, so you would have to collect data right at the start of them attending to determine where psychologically they were at and then see a few years later how things had developed. So I don't know of any studies that have been done but I think they would be quite difficult to do. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do them. Maybe that's something Danny would, uh, Danny and I can talk about. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Danny and I have, have spoken about that, um, Harry and I've, uh, there was a, a research done, I think, with about 3,000 men in Australia, obviously, where the men's shed started, of thousands of men who didn't go to the shed and thousands of men who did. But whether that's, um, which was a fantastic study, but like you're saying, to track it over their life for years, well, it's going to take years, isn't it, to do? And I think you're right. It's absolutely worthwhile Um the statistic that I heard the other day was uh, for ageing older people. We, I think we're about a, a million people in Scotland over the age of 50, I think it is at the moment. 
and in under 20 years, we'll have a you know almost 50% increase in that as well. So to do this kind of research for an aging, living longer population, I think you're absolutely right. So to get that research in place, um, obviously Danny and her crew at Glasgow Kelly want to continue, particularly looking at the men's health angle. Um, I think that's a conversation that hopefully, well, I know she's taking forward and, and with you, definitely if you two can have a conversation, really valuable. Yeah. Oh, she said, yeah, that would be great in the chat. So she'll get in touch with you in your busy schedule. Slot her in if you can. <laughs> right. Um, I don't see any. Oh, yes, I do. There's James. There's Alan. He's coming in. Okay, Alan. Uh, he's coming from Gable Endies. Uh, Gable Endies. Gable Endies. Men's shed. That's a slip there. But Alan, as you're here, he can gobble as much as I can. <laughs> so Alan, or is that Alan? Uh, on you come, mate, with your question. Good to see you. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Hold on. Fine. So uh, it's a question for yourself, Harry, and it really just reflects down to the fact that how do you feel about the gender uh, sort of uh, splitting the fact of men's sheds being male only and uh, the community shed aspect, which is the shared genders. What's your views on that? I, I don't have any hard and fast views. Um, I think, I mean, as a general principle, we're all in this together, men and women, and we can help. And uh, <laughs> women... My wife isn't around, she won't hear me saying this, but I wouldn't mind if she heard me saying this. Um, women tend to be more empathetic than men. You know, women tend to be a bit more softer and all that kind of thing. So it might do the men good to have a mixed, a community shed rather than a men's shed. But um, there will be some circumstances where men will want to be together with men. And I, I can't comment on that. I don't know enough about it. I haven't visited enough sheds or whatever, but it's up very much to, to local views. And it might be that, you know, three days a week, it's a men's shed and the other two days a week, it's a community shed. And if men or women don't want to mix, they still have the opportunity to, to, to attend and be part of a community. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes uh, sense, uh, particularly the fact of uh, so many days is a men's shed exclusively and so many days is a mixed gender. Yeah, I can see the possibilities of that, yeah. Okay, so that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, that, that question comes up a lot, and what we've also seen is that where some have become community sheds, uh, quite quickly, the ladies have decided that they don't want to hang out with the men and they want their own shed themselves. And to me, that's really important to see the benefit of uh, individual gendered spaces where conversations and often difficult health conversations wouldn't take place when we're together. And they certainly do take place in, in the men's sheds. And from what I'm told, the Scottish Women's Institute, which is now 102 years old with 16,000 women-only members, absolutely do not want men to join. They, the ladies and what their conversations are, are really important to them. And it's the same for the men. So I think that's a really good question, Alan, and something that's fielded more and more. Um, I think it's, it's work, working forward into the 21st century to have a gendered space, neutral space, is really important to recognise and a community space to come together at times as well is, of course, vitally important to socialise in. But as Harry said, we guys tend to find it more difficult to socialise in a good way, network where our good ladies are just masters of it. Us guys need a bit of help. And the men's shed seems to be that magnet that attracts us to get out the house and come together and do those good things. So, yeah. That I'm, I'm sure we'll have a blended approach over the years, as you've seen with other countries, but not to devalue the individual gendered spaces for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of other comments coming in, but we do have to move on. Thanks for that, Charlie. And uh, there was something else. Yes, yeah, some guys coming in there. Um, 
Good link there from Stuart Beck on the West Coast, uh, giving a link to Jimmy Reed's rectorial address if you want to listen to the whole thing. Very inspiring. So to wrap up our first presentation, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Harry, for making the time not only to do a fantastic presentation for us, but for being able to come and answer the questions of the guys and for being our patron once again. So important. Appreciate thank it. Yeah. Okay, thanks.